Befell that, in that season on a day in Southar, at the tabard as he lie ready to wenden on me pilgrimage to Canterbury, with full devout courage, at night was come into that hostelria well nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk. Beaventure falla in fellowship, and pilgrims were they alle that toward Canterbury walden rede. The chambres and the stablers were in wider, and well we were an ezed at a besta, and shortly, when the sun was to rest, so had he spoke. Hello there, come on in. Nice to see you again. I bet you wouldn't believe me if I told you that that was English, would you? Well, it was, but it was written six hundred years ago. It's strange, you know, but when we think of history, we think of people dressing differently, but we don't think of them speaking differently, writing differently as well. Well, that was English, and it was written by an English poet of the 14th century named Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer was a busy man of affairs. Most of his time was spent working for the king. Once he was in charge of the new building going on at Westminster and the Tower. He was born in London and lived here most of his life. For a few years he had rooms over the eastern gateway of the city at Allgate. But he quite often went abroad to Italy and France on the king's business. He could read several languages, Latin, French, Italian. In fact, when the day's work was over, he greatly enjoyed reading. He translated some of his favourite books into English, and he also wrote poems of his own, which the king invited him to read at court. King Richard II was young. He loved to wear fine clothes and costly jewels. He enjoyed music, singing and poetry. He encouraged poets like Chaucer to write for him and granted them a small salary every year. And so when the king and his friends wished to be entertained, Chaucer would be commanded to bring his latest poem and read it aloud to the court. Befell that. And that season on a day in Southwark, at the tabard as he lie ready to wend and on me pilgrimage to He's Cardiff. describing how one spring, while staying at the tabard inn in Southwark, he met a company of 29 pilgrims on their way to Canterbury to visit the tomb of St. Thomas a Becket. In fellowship, and pilgrims were they all that toward Canterbury world and reader. A nicht there was, and that a worthy man, that fro the timber that he first began. There was a knight who had fought many battles and had come to join the pilgrims at Southwark, still muddy and travel stained from his journey. With him there was his son, a young squeer. With him was his son, a squire, very young and handsome and gaily dressed. A yeoman had a hay, and servants namo. He had just one servant with him a yeoman with a coat of green, who was a forester and a good marksman with the bow. There was also a nonna, a prioress. There was also a nun, a prioress, who was most gentle and shy. The clerk from Oxford rode a skinny horse. He was very poor because he'd spent all his money on books. They had a cook with them who could boil, bake, roast and fry. Also, a doctor of physic, who seemed to know the cure for every illness. 
And then there was the wife of Bath. She had married five husbands and had been on many pilgrimages. There was a miller, a big, ugly man, who played the bagpipes merrily as they rode out of town. And then there was Chaucer himself, who in the poem joined the, the company of pilgrims and rode with them to Canterbury. They agreed that each of them would tell a story and this would pass away the time as they journeyed to Canterbury. And so Chaucer's long poem was called The Canterbury Tales because it was all about the pilgrims and the stories they told on their way to Canterbury to visit the great cathedral and the tomb of St. Thomas a Becket. The king liked to surround himself with beautiful things. Chaucer would doubtless have presented his patron with a richly bound copy of his book and he would have engaged a scribe to write out this copy for him. I'm a scribe, and if Chaucer had wanted me to write out his book for the king, the first thing I'd have to think about was the vellum, which I'd write the book out on. Vellum is calfskin, or parchment, which is sheepskin. and. In those days, because they didn't have pencils, they would prick through each sheet, several sheets at a time, like this with a needle, so as to give me the marks to rule the lines on. And as I say, they didn't have pencils. You see, that would go through several sheets at a time. Now, not having pencils, they'd then take out a ivory or pointer and a ruler and score through making marks which are sort of scratches really on the surface rather than pencil marks. marks. Now if you go into the museum and look at old manuscripts, have a look closely and see if you can see the pinprick holes which the scribe has left in there and notice that they didn't use pencils but they scored lines with an ivory pointer. Now the next thing to do would be to make my pen. Now, in those days, they used to make a pen with a feather. We call it a quill. I'm going to make one for you. First thing they'd do would be to get rid of these things here. Because obviously, if they get in the way, stick up your nose into your arm. If you didn't get rid of them, take a sharp knife, cut it off, sharp like that. Next thing would be to strip off this barb as we call it, so that's out of the way as well. They weren't concerned with looks. This was going to be a business-like tool. The next thing they would do would be to scoop the underside from the feather away like so. Take out this little thing inside that we're finding. The next job would be to put a slit in it to carry the ink from the pen to the point. Next, again, we'll shape the point, and this is where you'll begin to recognise the shape of the pen nib that you use nowadays on your fountain pen. There you have the shape, and all that's needed now is for the final point to be put on the nib. This way we do it. One cut like so to slant, and the final downward chop to make it nice and clean to write with. And there we have it. Now, I'm going to write. I take the vellum that I've scored, I pick up the pen, and I start to write. After I dip it in the ink. Now, I have here something to copy from. It'll probably be something that Chaucer wrote while he was riding on horseback across the fields, trying to pen out. I'll leave a space for the capital afterwards. You see, I don't work quite quickly. 
That's how Faust described would always work. He, obviously, all books had to be written by hand in those days, and it couldn't have been done all that slowly. Or it would have taken too long. The book would never have been finished. As you can see how it would be done. And the quill writes very beautifully. Fits in the hand very comfortably. And the letters are made by not pressing too hard on the pen because the pen was cut square as you saw me do it it becomes thick and thin simply by changing the angle of it the pen as I walk, go along to tabard as I lay now what if I made a mistake everybody makes mistakes and I'm sure that the scribe who wrote Chaucer's book made a mistake too. I often make mistakes, and I'll show you how we get rid of them. Well, we take the same knife that we use to sharpen the quill. And because skin has got several layers, we can usually get away with carefully, if the knife is sharp, carefully scraping away the letter. And if we do it very carefully, we won't go too deep so that we can alter the so that we'll be able to write on top of it again afterwards. So there you are, so you have to take it off. And if we're lucky, I'll be able to put it back again. I think we want a T there. Yes, it's gone on all right. If you look very carefully at the books in the museum, see if you can see where the scribes made a mistake. It's sure to have made a mistake somewhere. Have a good look. Now, there's something missing here. Usually, the scribes began a verse or a line of writing with a decor decorated capital letter. This was to bring the I to the right place, to the beginning of the lettering. I'm going to make a decorative capital B. One of the most exciting things about old manuscripts is the use of gold in the decoration on the pages. This is where the word illumination comes from, where the light playing on the leaves of gold, the leaves which have got gold on them, shines, reflects. I'm going to show you how I do it. It's made with gesso, which is a mixture of sugar, lead, plaster, made into a paste, and drawn onto the vellum with a quill just the same way as the writing. I'm going to take a piece of vellum here, stretched on a board, I'm going to use it. Just make a little crown, just like so. When it dries, which it won't do for a little while, it stays raised, it doesn't dry flat like ordinary paint you use. And I make a little picture like so, and it'll dry slightly raised. Now onto that raised thing I'm going to put gold leaf which will make it look like solid gold. Gold leaf is very thin. This is some here. Beaten gold. Very very thin. It moves in the air. And As I've done another crown over here I'm going to gild that one while the other dries. 
How I do it is by breathing onto the gesso to make it sticky. The dampness in my breath will make it sticky. I'm going to do it now. The leaf is then put over the thing and burnished with a stone, polished stone burnisher. I don't know, let's try and make that shine like real solid gold. And as you can see, it's coming up very bright. I don't know if you can see it very well, it's coming. It's like really just shining like real gold. The next thing would be to clean it off around. And from the dazzle, which you can see, you know where the word illumination comes from. The medieval scribes who decorated and illuminated their books so beautifully show us how people lived in those days. Country folk breaking up the soil in the fields. Ploughing with oxen. Sowing the seed. Bringing in the harvest. And we can also see what London must have looked like, with the tower and London Bridge in the distance. But of course, only very rich people would own such beautiful books, or indeed any books at all, until it was possible to make copies more quickly by the invention of printing. Here's a page about the knight in the Canterbury Tales, printed by William Caxton, who introduced the new idea to England. At St Bride's Printing Museum in the city, we can see how the early printers worked. They started off with tiny metal letters which were placed into a flat tray. Ink was rolled on very carefully to make sure that it was even. Then a sheet of paper was lowered onto the inky letters and pressed down firmly so that the ink was transferred to the paper. good printer worked rhythmically, stretching and relaxing his muscles so that he could go on for long hours, making each copy perfect. And nowadays, electric power means that the printing presses can work much faster and turn out much more. And now, well, we can even get Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in paperback. You know, it's jolly lucky for us in some ways that those medieval scribes used skin, vellum and parchment, and that they used long-lasting inks and uh, gold leaf and things like that, because this means that their work has lasted. And you can see many wonderful medieval manuscripts in the London museums and you can see early printed books as well. And, well, there are other reminders of medieval life, smaller perhaps, but just as interesting, 
like these, for instance. Now, these are badges, souvenirs, if you like. You know, when you come back from holiday, you bring back souvenirs, flags, badges, car stickers, that sort of thing. Well, they had their souvenirs, too. These are badges that the pilgrims brought back from Canterbury to prove that they'd actually visited the tomb of St. Thomas of Becket. And there we are, a present from Canterbury. And now I suppose you think I'm going to tell you about the next programme's about. And you're right, of course, as usual. In the next programme, we're going to be looking at the Tudors. And we hope to see you then as well. Goodbye.